is I went through and outlined the whole book. And so I hope this is a blessing to you. I mean, obviously there are many good commentaries that are out there that you could read. But just on my own, I just kind of saw a theme there. And, uh, and just interpreted it as it's directed. And so when we studied 1 John, as I mentioned this morning, the series was entitled Knowing the Christ of Christianity. And what was the one word in that Bible study that kind of was consistent that we talked about throughout? Does anybody remember? Love, yeah, okay. The heart. It was the word fellowship. And I use that word quite a bit because we see the fellowship uh, uh, aspect of our relationship with God and with others. And so the word that we're going to see commonly used in, Galat- in, the, in the book that Paul writes to the churches of Galatia is the word, is, is the gospel. Okay? And so that's why I put knowing the gospel of Christianity, the true faith. And so we're going to certainly use verses outside of, of this book, but we're going to just do an expositional study of this uh, Sunday evenings as the Lord gives me opportunity when it's my turn to preach. So sometimes we won't have services or it's not my turn to preach, but this is what we're going to do, Lord willing. We'll see how long it takes us to get through, and uh, we'll, we'll do it until we're done. So let's begin. I don't have notes to hand out, but and you could uh, just drag the cursor over here to the screen. All right, there we go. And so, as I said before, the, the key word is this word, euangelion, and it's where we get the word evangelist. Um, so we say evangel, or the gospel. When Andrew and I were in uh, Bible college, we had different societies, and so Andrew was part of uh, Erite, I think was the name of hers, right? Or, or Erite? Okay. And the one that I joined was called euangelistes. Now, that's kind of the English way of pronouncing it, but it's the Greek word for evangelist. And so it comes from this root word, euangelion, which is oftentimes translated as gospel. It means good message or good news. So what is the gospel, church? What is the gospel? Death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Is that not good news? Is there one gospel? There is only one gospel. And so... Paul's letter um, is based upon the fact that he already has a relationship with these churches. Now, some of you have study Bibles like I do, and there's you know, a lot of paragraphs giving background info. We're still going to go over it, but I know sometimes I've had people say, well, what about this or what about that? There are th- people who have theories and different ideas. Who was he actually writing to? Was he writing to the churches of the northern part of Galatia versus the ones in the southern part of Galatia? I'll show you a map in a moment. But the point is, is that, and I believe it was the southern uh, cities of Galatia, the point is, is that there was some serious false doctrine taking place. So Paul, in the spirit of love, addresses that. And you know what? When we love, we want to address problems in a loving way, but in a direct way. And so we're not loving by skirting around the issue. Sometimes people think that that's love when it's really not. I think Paul was a very direct person. And I think that he saw things, and and I think as you're walking in truth, it doesn't necessarily matter what your personality is. When you're walking in truth, you love the truth, and you understand what the truth is. Paul said that he was a steward of the gospel. He took that very seriously. There are many false messages going out there today. There are many false Christs. Did not John even say that? Try the spirits, whether they be of God. And so we know that there will be many false Christs, which there are even today. Louis Farrakhan just said that he is the Messiah. The nation of Islam. He said he is the Messiah. And by the way, Muslims do not believe that Jesus ever died on the cross. They do not worship the God of the Bible, folks. And so we need to understand that there are many who preach a false... Now, the word gospel comes from two words that... It's it's an older English word means good spell or good word. So we, we say the gospel and we immediately think of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But really, if somebody told you that somebody that you've been praying for, like let's say Dusty, is no longer struggling health-wise, would we say gospel? We'd say good news, right? Hey, that's wonderful news. But in a sense, that's the proclamation of something that's great. Wonderful news. Fantastic. So we say the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, 
We're going to do a little bit of background to kind of help us get going here. So this may take a little bit, and then we'll get right into the meat of it. I want to look at one, possibly two thoughts tonight concerning um, the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, so we said Wangilion and what that means. Okay, so let's give a little bit of background. First of all, the author is very clear. It, it's, it's clearly Paul. Now, this date right here, you know, some people think it was 48, 49. Some people think he wrote it before the Jerusalem Council. Some people think it afterwards. The point is that Paul is clearly a human author. In fact, go to the end of this book. All right, go to chapter 6, verse 11. And in my Bible, it just says, Paul's closing remarks. He says, you see how large a letter I have written with you, uh, unto you with what? My own hand. Paul wrote this. <laughs> Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, of course. But this is probably one of the most... Uh, obvious authorship, there's no, you know, Hebrews, who, who knows who wrote Hebrews, it doesn't necessarily matter, but we do, we do know that Paul is clearly the author, and he tells us that, not only by beginning with a greeting, but also saying, I wrote this. He says, how large of a letter that I wrote to you. I wanted you to know that this is from me. Another thought is this, that he writes to clarify the true understanding of salvation by faith in Christ alone. So it's not He's clarifying what the gospel is, but also understanding what it truly means to be saved and how we are saved. I found a quote that somebody sent me, and I want to read it to you. It's very interesting, concerning the way in which these, the book of Galatians and James uh, uh, flow together. The book of Galatians and the letter that James writes deal with two complementary aspects of Christianity. Galatians highlights the gospel of grace that produces righteous living. James highlights the righteous living that proves that we have true faith. There is no conflict. James 2 emphasizes the new birth through the gospel, and Galatians spends its final two chapters applying the doctrine of sola gratia, or by grace uh, alone, to practical Christian living. And so we're going to see that, and I hope this is exciting to you, that as we study through the book of Galatians, that this is a very important letter, because we see its application to the Jewish believer as well as to the Gentile believer. So there's no doubt that Paul is the author. All right, concerning the audience, we know that it's to the churches of the Lord Jesus Christ scattered throughout Galatia, as compared to letters that were written to the church at Ephesus or Thessalonica or Philippi or the church at Rome. These are to the churches of Galatia. And that's why there's a little bit of debate that's out there, but not really it's most likely the churches that, he has, that Paul helped to establish on his first missionary journey. And that's why I believe that he already had that strong relationship that enabled him to write the way that he wrote. And we'll see in just a moment how he gets right into it. He says, he says hello, it's me, Paul. I love you. Grace and peace be unto you. And then says, what are you guys doing? <laughs> he gets right into it. There's no other pleasantries beyond that. Um, and I think sometimes the people that we love the most are ones that we can speak to directly without worrying that it's going to be received the wrong way. Now, I was debating about whether or not to put this map up. I don't know how well you can see. <laughs> I'm standing right next to it. I can barely see it. But you can just see some of these churches that are down here, Iconium, Lystra, Derby. These are probably the churches that he was addressing right here. This whole region is called Galatia. Remember, he's... Paul talks about how, uh, like when he writes in 2 Timothy about Cilicia, that's where he's from originally, Tarsus. You can see what we call Asia Minor, and over here some of the churches that were in Greece. So it just kind of helps you to kind of put things into perspective where they were and why that would make sense that he's not necessarily talking about the churches that were up here, but more so these ones down here. Okay? So. Second thought is this, that the Apostle Paul wrote to teach these believers how to identify the true gospel of the Christian faith. To know a fraud, you have to know clearly the, the right one. You have to know the truth. And so that's what he's addressing um, and what he's dealing with. And so that leads us to really understanding the purpose, which is twofold. Paul not only establishes his apostleship, and this is important, because some did not think that he was a true apostle. Why? Yeah, his past, but he was not there. He didn't see Christ risen. Okay, and so there was some that thought, well, he didn't really have that authority. In fact, some would argue, and some commentators that I respect would say that perhaps the churches of Galatia said, well, you know, I know what Paul says, but, you know, we're going to do our own thing here. Like, what, what authority does he have? And you could see 
how Paul explains certain things about how he even received the gospel. Very clear. He's not boasting or bragging, but he's glorying in the Lord and what Christ chose to do in and through him. So that is important because his defense of his apostleship helped him to be viewed as one who had authority. In fact, he says the gospel is not a man-made invention. And so certainly what Peter and James and the other leaders preached in Israel, but as he went forward, he preached, he had authority to do the same. He had equal authority as the pillars of the church, like Peter and James and John and so forth. Another thing to think about, if you're taking notes, is the purpose of this uh, letter is also to understand that defense of the one true gospel uh, given to all true apostles by the Lord Jesus Christ. So, He's not only defending his apostleship, but saying, it was given to me. That's why I said earlier that he, was, that he viewed himself as a steward. He was entrusted. He was called to preach the gospel. All right? So I think it's important that we understand that moving forward as we think about uh, who wrote it, the immediate audience. And, of course, we know that this letter is inspired, so therefore the church of the Lord Jesus Christ has had in possession the Word of God, and we see its value today. So we're going to uh, figure it out. We're going to discern it. Um, we're going to uh, you know, understand what it's saying and then make proper application. All right? So let's get into it. The first point, there's 10. There's going to be 10 points. Not tonight. Not the 10 points tonight. But over the time of this study, there'll be 10 major points. The first thought is the uniqueness of the Christian gospel. All right? The uniqueness of the Christian gospel. What makes it unique? Well, let's, look at ver- let's start reading verse 1. The Bible says, Paul, an apostle. Now, it's interesting. We've already talked about this, but let's, let's talk about it a little bit more. Notice what it says in parentheses here. Not of men, neither by man. Interesting. Not of men, neither by man. But by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. You see right away? He's clarifying what authority he had. Who called him to be an apostle? Now, Paul would oftentimes use the word servant in writing who he was, and so did Peter. But here Paul says right away, I'm not, it's not because I chose or I made myself an apostle, nor did other people say, oh, you're, we're going to make you an apostle. He said, Jesus, God the Father and Jesus Christ declared me and made me an apostle. So he goes on to explain that a little bit. Let's keep reading. Verse 2, he's, and he's writing to all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia. I think it's important that we see that he's addressing them as true believers. The word brethren is an intimate word. Connected with the Greek word koinonia, it means fellowship, to be in agreement. That these are brothers, our brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's why I think it's good that we address one another that way that we call one another brother and sister because that is biblical and that invokes the uh, the understanding that we are part of the family of God. But we see that he's writing specifically to the churches of Galatia. Verse 3, he writes, Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever." and ever. Amen. So he begins by talking about very important things about our relationship, the basis of our relationship, and of course writes about how much we are certainly thankful for the great blessing that we have, that our sins have been truly forgiven, and he is the one who's delivered us. So we see the work right away of salvation, being of God, not of man. And this is important that we understand this, because what he's addressing, the plague that had, that had come about by these false teachers was this idea that man earns his way, a false gospel. Man earns his way to salvation. And so let's, let's take a look at, at verses 6 through 10 tonight. All right, but it's interesting what it says in Romans 1.16. I was transferred from my computer to the computer in the sound booth and always kind of goofs it up a little bit sometimes, but it should say Romans 1.16 at the bottom. Let's say it out loud together. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Romans 1.16. So what does it say here? 
The gospel of Christ is the what? Power of God unto salvation. So a couple thoughts tonight as we think about the importance of recognizing the true gospel, the uniqueness of the gospel. Let's look at verse 6. He gets right into it. I've had some commentators that I was, as I was studying this, that Paul was angry. I think he was disappointed. He was uh, certainly upset. And I think it's okay when we are upset that we deal with it the right way. He had every reason to. He says, I marvel. I am amazed. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Do you sense the disappointment there? Do you sense his heart, his pastoral care? We kind of read this in a modern way saying, what in the world happened? <laughs> what did you do? It was a mess. But here's the thing that he's saying. He goes, when he writes the word marvel, it, it, it surprised him. He, that, that word is also translated with an understanding of being kind of baffled or, or whatever. But I want you, if you're taking notes, I want you to, to look at, uh, there's two words that are translated the same way in English, but have different uh, Greek words. And it's important that we distinguish that. He not only is, is you know, marveled, or, or, or he does, not only is he marveling or, or amazed at this, he says, you're soon removed. You're soon cut off in a sense. This word removed is a pretty intense word that carries with it that something is off. For those of you that work construction, if you're off just a little bit, that can make a big difference, does it not? This removal is making something not fit. Okay, so that's that. That's that word. You say you've been removed. It's something's off the foundation. What I've been informed of is not good at all because it's going to have a ripple effect. So that's that word. He says, "From him that is God that called you into the grace of Christ unto another." The word "another" in the in verse six is different than verse seven. The word "another" is hetero. Now. When we think about hetero, we often think of something of being opposite, that opposite attracts. But here the word could carry with it the idea of another, meaning something that isn't, that is either distorted or strange. It is not right. And this is what he's saying. So the word another is, and, and that's why he says, not that there, he says, which is not another. And then he uses the word a different word for another. See, it's not another. It's not an alternative. So it's not like we're saying, well, I like to go to this store. We go to Hannaford. Oh, I go to Market Basque. Oh, yeah, you find, you find milk there either way, either place. He's not saying it that way. He's not saying it's another one that still works. He's saying this is a strange and this is a distorted message. Okay? I think it's very important that we understand that. Now, I think we do. But it, so, you know, I heard people talk about prosperity gospel and all different kinds of gospel. What he was dealing with were people that have been come to be labeled by, by some Bible scholars over the years as, as Judaizers, and that they were bringing in the Mosaic law and basically saying to the Christian church, you had to become Jewish in order to become a Christian. Okay? And that's what was being taught, and that is totally wrong. Because that is not grace, that is the law. And if you could look in 2 Corinthians, it even talks about how the law was fulfilled, and so some people accuse that position as being antinomianism, which is a rejection of the law, and I'll talk about that maybe a little bit later. But the, if you're taking notes and you see that word another, it's a very intense word, okay? So that's why it says it's not another. It's a strange one. So the King James translators used that word and then said it, which is not another but we have an understanding that means strange or distorted. So first thought is this. Paul's loving rebuke addresses the serious problem of false teachers who had perverted the pure gospel. They had perverted it. So much so that there were those that had a wrong understanding of not sanctification. There's Christians that can argue over different things that involve how we conduct ourselves as true believers. I have friends of mine that attend churches where they believe it's a sin for a woman not to have her head covered. They would teach that. Or, you know, other things that have to do with eating, dietary things. And those are just one of those interpretation issues. This is not a matter of sanctification. This is a matter of salvation. 
This is what we call soteriology, not sanctification. So look what it says in verse 7. He says, it's not another. It's not valid. It says, but there be some that, what's the next word? Trouble. And it's word like irritate. It's this causing friction. He says, these people that, that trouble you, and then it says, how are they troubling you? It says, and would, what's the next word? Pervert, change. I was asking Andrew about this. The word, the root word for pervert is where we get the English word uh, metastasize. And, and so, because we were talking about this, obviously I, we learned a lot of stuff about cancer when Andrew went through that. And, there's a, and so when something metastasizes, I said, is that limited to uh, breast cancer? But it's any type of cancer metastasize. And what, what happens? What's involved in that? It spreads, but it's changing. And not in a good way, is it? Okay? And the cells are reproducing and, and all the things that are involved in that. That's this word. Pervert. It's changing in a, in a terrible way. So really, you could say that this false teaching that was being taught in the church, churches of Galatia was a cancerous tumor. And that's how Paul was writing about it. That's why Paul was so emphatic about his, with his language. He said, and so he writes about how he marvels that they had, had, had shifted from receiving salvation by grace alone, through faith, that they would somehow think it could be earned, that all these hoops needed to be, uh, you know, you had to go through all these hoops in order to be saved. He goes, who was teaching you this? Did I ever teach you that? So he says, it's not another, but there'll be some that trouble you, they bother you, they irritate you, they, they, they cause you to, to stumble, and would pervert the gospel of Christ. That's why I, the heading of this section is the one true gospel. Now, I want you to see, as we get going on this, I want to make another thought here, and that is this. False doctrine was a real problem. It continues to be a real problem. And their false doctrine robbed God of the glory due His name. We all know what it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. But let's, let's say it out loud together. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we see here the one true gospel is by God's grace, a demonstration of His love, and we receive it by faith, and that alone is how we are saved. And so what does the gospel perversion, what do we see here taking place? A couple thoughts. First one is this, actually three thoughts. Teaching a, or it should say, A shouldn't be there, teaching another way to be saved. All right? Teaching another way to be saved. And I put the word another, and I've already explained it, but this is what they were saying. Or this is the, the proper way, and Paul wasn't telling us the right way, and these false teachers come along, and are these teachers of God? They are not. They were perverting the gospel. They were changing the gospel. And this is what he's talking about. He warns them. Verse 8, look what it says. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. I'm going to explain what that word means, and, and it's a very intense word, but we'll get there in just a moment. Another thought is this, concerning the perversion of the gospel, that, that, so they were teaching another way to be saved, but they were rejecting the sufficiency of Christ's offering. They were saying that Jesus is not enough. That there's, yeah, we're thankful that Jesus did what he did, but in order to be saved, that's why I always get nervous when I talk to, uh, whether it's young people or adults, I say, I gave my life to Jesus. And they think that that's what it means to be saved. I said, at what point did you get saved then? Why? Well, I gave my life. And they may not be using the, 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 the verbiage right, but some people are saying, well, I don't know if I'm going to make it to heaven. It depends on how good I did on, on this earth. If I pass the test. Is that what the Bible teaches? It does not. That is not salvation. It's not biblical salvation. I had the blessing over last week of having every student in my Bible class, the 9th through 12th grade students here at Tabernacle, give and stand up before their classmates and me and give their salvation testimony and six other categories. And they all spoke, on average, five to six minutes. This is not an easy thing. Becca did a good job, but Becca, were you a little nervous when you did that? Or you're a natural, that's why. 
but a little bit nervous. Everyone was. Daniel got up and he spoke, and Joshua did a good job. Bree did a wonderful job, and all the kids did great. And it was good for them to verbalize their testimony. This is when I got saved. So one of the categories was religious upbringing. Do you know your parents' testimony? Are they born again? Interesting, we heard some of the foreign exchange students. Um, Zhang Su's parents, I think, or some, some of these parents are Buddhist. It was interesting when they were sharing that. And so they're all giving, you know, I was raised in church or whatever. When did you realize that you were a sinner and needed Christ to save you? Was there anything else that was needed in order to be saved? Does the Bible teach that? This is the cancerous tumor that was being taught, that Jesus was not sufficient, that they needed to do something more in order to be really saved. And that is a false gospel. That is a perversion of the truth. The, the final thought I want you to think about concerning the gospel perversion that was taking place and continues to is adding to the message that the Apostle Paul had already, should say, gave or given. This is what he says in verse 8. Notice again, he says, but though we or an angel from heaven. I find this interesting that angels from heaven gave messages from God. So what does he mean by this? An angel from heaven? I mean, there's a lot of people today, especially in our charismatic circles, that say that angels are talking to them and giving them visions and, and all this other stuff. We believe that God's word and God's revelation is closed and it's here in the word of God. And so we see this is, is important. So he's saying, even an angel from heaven, even if we did it, is what is Paul. Look what he says. He says, but though we, or an angel from heaven, do what? Preach any other gospel unto you. He's saying, if we come along and modify it, or an angel from heaven gave you a, another message. I mean, I, I look at this and saying, I think he's just trying to emphasize the point that it is a settled message. So Paul has no intention of changing it, and an angel from heaven would not do that. That's how powerful he's making the statement. Because obviously there were people, human beings, false teachers, who had come along and preached another gospel. So if it conflicted with Paul, they obviously, some of them, not all of them, but some of them allowed these false teachers to teach in these churches, and Paul says, let them be Cursed. Now, as I said before, this is a very intense word. It's the Greek word anathema. First of all, I think the direct thing is for us to understand that he's not saying that they should be brought outside and shot. But they should be shunned. They should be kicked out of the church. That's what he's saying. Now, there is an understanding of cursing. And, and we could look at Deuteronomy. The Bible talks about idols that were brought into the house to be brought out. So there is disciplinary action that should be taken among the churches. And this was what was happening, is that this church had allowed these false teachers to teach. It'd be different than if all of a sudden somebody across the street, which we've actually had happen, had some signs that said, this church is teaching hate. Are we letting them preach? They have the right to protest? NASA lied? A few years ago, Pastor Miller? I was out there with a sign, NASA lied, because this guy wanted to tell us why the, the earth was flat, and we didn't want to give him the time or day about that. What's that? He was right, yeah. <laughs> but you know, it's not that they were kind of like, like coming into the windows of their houses where they met and said, hey, uh, you know, let me tell you something. They were allowed to preach from the pulpit. They were being allowed by the leadership of the churches to have a word. And so I think that this certainly implies that there was a, they, they needed to be removed. But also that God's blessing would not be upon them. We see it's a very powerful word, and it's used in different places in different ways. So Paul is hoping that they would repent, but they need to be not viewed as any authority. They need to be out. They need to be accursed. Treated that way as you would with any object that is not of God. So look what it says in verse 9. As we said before. So obviously there was communication. I think he's probably talking about when he came and ministered to them originally. So it was a while ago. He said, so say I now again, if any man preach another gospel unto you that ye have received, let him be accursed. In case you didn't get it the first time, I'm going to say it again. 
Now, somehow they may have missed it the first time that it was being said. They didn't understand that the gospel message was not a message that somehow that was just kind of viewed as an opinion. And that's why it's so important that we understand this. You might say, well, Pastor Small, we get the gospel. We understand it. We know what the true gospel is. Good. And praise the Lord for that. But there will be, over time, satanic efforts through false teachers to bring in something that sounds good, that sometimes makes us wonder, well, we really need to reevaluate what we believe. And there are some people who come in and try to pervert the truth and, may I say, the simplicity of the gospel. Verse 10 reads, for do I now persuade men? Am I trying to convince you on my own? Am I trying to convince God that maybe this gospel should be accepted? Look what he says. Do I seek to please men? Paul had no problem saying, I am not here to make, (laughs) in a sense he's saying, I'm not here to try to say this in a man-pleasing way. What you have allowed is absolutely contagious. And wrong. These false teachers need to be accursed, and you need to repent from this. He says, or do I seek to please men? For if I, for if I yet please men, if that was my motivation in ministry, Paul's saying, I should not be the servant of Christ. And that's one of the signs of a false teacher, is they constantly morph, and they, and they run to the front of the pack, and that's how they lead. And they change things, and certainly this is not of God. Do you see Paul's Uh, intensity, the way that he speaks. It's interesting that Jude has something very similar to say. Jude writes, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the what? What does it say? Of the common salvation. How are we saved? Act of God's grace through faith alone. It was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you. What does it mean to be exhorted? Strongly convinced or, hey, this is important. Please listen. That's what it means. He says, I wanted to strongly urge you or exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for what? The faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Don't you think that involves the true gospel? Absolutely. Why would you have to contend for? The word contend means to fight, does it not? So there, there has to be lines. It isn't, we have a big tent here, and so you have your gospel, and, and we have our gospel, and... Can't we all just get along? That's not what Paul was saying would be acceptable. It's not another gospel. It is a perverted gospel that must be rejected. Let those false teachers be kicked out. The second thought I want us to see tonight connects to that. And it goes from verses 11 all the way down about, uh, towards maybe about the middle of this chapter. And I want to just talk about this in closing. is the testimony of the Christian gospel. The uniqueness of it. There is one faith. There is one gospel. There was one message. Now, Paul says, says if, if I didn't preach emphatically the truth, and I did it to please man, then I should not be the servant of Christ. Did the churches of Galatia respect Paul? I think they did. Had they been deceived? Yes. And that's why it's, we have to remember that those that peddle a false gospel are deceived to deceivers. We need to have a heart to reach them and not say, well, they have their beliefs and we have ours and we just need to coexist. We need to be willing to preach the gospel, which is powerful, amen, church? And confront them in love, not to just prove them wrong, but to help them. So verse 11, let's read on. But I certify you, and the word certify is I strongly I'm speaking very boldly. That The word he's, he's saying, I, I absolutely want to authenticate what I'm saying. I certify you, brethren. Notice he calls them brethren again. My brothers, my sisters, uh, fellow children of God, that the gospel which was preached of me is not what? After man. Go back to verse 1. What did he say about his apostleship? It was not by man. The gospel was not by man. And so it's not after man. It's not man's concoction. It's not man's invention. In fact, that's what I want us to see. In Acts chapter 20, verse 24, when he called the elders together from Ephesus, and he was at Miletus, he says, but none of these move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy, watch, 
and the ministry, what was his ministry? To preach the gospel, which I have received of the Lord Jesus, not his own calling, not his own doing, but what Christ had called him and separated him to do, to what? To testify the gospel of the grace of God. To testify. So this is what he intended to do. Do you see the language here? See how it's connected to the second point? This is what he's doing. So not only did he say, I'm an apostle of God, called by the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ spoke to me, gave me this. I preached. I came and ministered to you. I'm saddened that you have, that you have listened to people who are preaching a false gospel. Then we get to verse 12. It says, For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but what? What is the, what is the last phrase there in verse 12 say, church? But by what? The revelation of Jesus Christ. If we, have, if we see the gospel as non-negotiable, if it's unique, we see Paul testifying of what it had done in his life. Because there is only one true gospel. Okay? So what I want us to think about is Paul's conversion. First thought is this. Paul wanted the churches of Galatia to understand without a doubt that the gospel of Christ was not his creation, but rather a revelation given to him by the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what verse 12 tells us very clearly. We can see that's why there's no argument over the authorship of this divine letter. Because he's saying, I testified this. And, and when he writes to the church of Thessalonica, he says, he, he says, we didn't preach ourselves, right? Remember when he wrote that? He says, we preach not ourselves, but Christ and him crucified. He's saying, it's not us. There are a lot of religious groups that follow a man and his teachings. They, be, they become disciples of them. Paul never said to become a disciple of him. He said become disciples of Christ. Even though he said that he was a good example in some areas, like sometimes not getting married or whatever. He said, you remain unmarried like me, but if you cannot contain, you know, contain, it's better to marry than to burn. So that would be an example of you saying, follow my example. But he did not say to become disciples of him. He said, become disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's proclaiming, he's wangalistes, he's an evangelist, he's preaching the gospel. Verse 13, for ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion. Isn't it interesting that he, that he words it that way? He's saying my past, but the religion I had before I came to know the true Messiah. I praise the Lord for ministries like Jews for Jesus, even though I don't necessarily agree with everything that they stand for, but for the most part. And I'm working on trying to see if we can get one of their, they call them evangelists, that we've had, like we've had in the past, to come and do. And we've had two or three times we've had Christ in the Passover. I'm looking to have an evangelist come perhaps in the fall to do a presentation on Christ in the tabernacle. It's amazing. Pastor Price actually used to teach on that, which is really exciting. Christ in the tabernacle. But we think about this. These are Messianic Jews. They're Jewish in their heritage, but they've become born again. They believe that Jesus is the Messiah. They identify themselves as Christians. So he says, my time passed in the Jews' religion. Watch. How that beyond measure, I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. Remember, I was a little kid. We picking teams for kickball. So we're going to waste you. That was an 80s thing, I guess. We're going we're gonna to annihilate you. And that's that word. It's a pretty heavy word. So he, so he says, you remember who I once was. I was a very zealous Jew. I thought I was serving God. I hurt, attempted to hurt the gospel. What it says in verse 14. I profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in my own nation. We read Philippians chapter 3, remember he talks a little bit about who he was. He said, everything that I was, I count but loss. Really, dung, he said, it was worthless. He said, above many my equals in my own nation, as we continue reading church in verse 14, being more exceeding, exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God, meaning this was God's will, Pastor Hawkins taught a little bit ago to our high school students about the discerning the will of God. So we see pleasing God, the will of God, discerning. When, when, when the will of God came about, the, the proper time, it said that God who separated me from my mother's womb, meaning that was Paul's predestined plan, says, and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen Immediately, I conferred not with flesh and blood. I knew this was of God. 
That was God's calling upon his life. He's very emphatic about it. In fact, I want you to note this also. Paul wanted the churches of Galatia to understand that his life was radically transformed through the gospel. And this is why he's saying this. This is why it's so important that we understand this. He, he's, he's saying all this to explain, the gospel was given to me, and it changed me. And, and now I'm preaching that. So it says in verse 17, Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him fifteen days. But other of the apostles saw I none save James, the Lord's brother. Now the things which I write unto you, behold, before God, I what? I lie not. Now I wonder sometimes why we feel the need to say this. Like, I'm telling you the truth. Would you think that I'm lying? Maybe he wrote this because he had preached them the gospel and they believed something else. Maybe he felt the need to say, this is the truth. It changed me. The gospel that I received of the Lord Jesus Christ has changed me. That's the gospel that I preached to you many years ago. Why did you think that it was something else? Why did you attach these wrong things? Why did you do this? In fact, if you look all the way over to chapter 3, he actually writes about how, he says, oh, foolish Galatians, he calls them that. Out of love, I'm sure. Nobody likes being called a fool, but he calls them that. He says, who hath bewitched you? Who hath cast a spell that you would behave this way? He loved them. He did. Sometimes we need to hear that in a tough love way. But that's what he's saying. So anyways, in verse 21, he says, afterwards I came unto the regions of Syria and Cilicia. Those are places just south and east of Galatia. And so, of course, Tarsus is in Cilicia. He talks about how he went there, and then he says, but I was known, unknown by face unto the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But word spread, right? We know from other places that they said, hey, you know the Saul guy that was killing all of our brothers and sisters in Christ? God saved him. No way, no way, no way. He's a spy. That's how he was probably being viewed, right? So he says, I never met anybody besides Peter and James. And then he says, I was unknown by face. They just heard about me. The verse, what it says, verse 23. But they had heard only that which he which persecuted us in time past now preacheth the faith which once he what? Destroyed. Praise God. Now, I love verse 24. I love it. And they glorified God in me. They didn't glorify Paul. That's why he said this. He didn't achieve salvation. Salvation wasn't a reward. It was given. That's what, that's what grace is. And so when other believers see the transformed life, they will glorify God, not man. And so it doesn't matter if someone's speaking before thousands of people or just a handful of people or a group like this tonight. When we talk about the changed life, it's not because of all the great things that we have done but rather God working in us and us trusting God by faith. And, let, and let whatever God has for us, we're submissive to that. Whatever, wherever he leads, whatever door of opportunity he gives for us, we walk through. But you see the language that's being used here to say, they glorify God in me? What an awesome phrase to think about. A couple closing thoughts about the transformed life. And we think about Paul's old life versus new life. A couple thoughts will be done. Number one, he was a zealous follower of the traditions of the Jewish religion who then became a passionate preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, it's interesting that, as I said before, it seems like Paul is a pretty direct guy, personality-wise. And, and so I, I think he was very passionate about truth, and God takes that and changes him and makes him a bold proclaimer of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Or once, he said, a couple of different places, he had somehow excelled in everything that he was trying to do. He wanted to be the best. And all I'm saying is that God takes that zeal and that passion and redirects it, and through the Spirit of God, he becomes one who would be on the receiving end of persecution. Remember, he was the one who held the coats of the men who killed Stephen. And now he's the one going about. He went to, remember, Lystra, Iconium, and Derbe. In fact, the Jews hated him so much, once they kicked him out of the city that he was in, they followed him. And said, we got to put this guy down. It wasn't a cruise ship type life that he had. 
and his ministry was very difficult. Another thought in closing that I want you to think about is this. He was a destroyer of the church of God. He even says it in verse 13. He says, I wasted it. I persecuted it. I attempted to destroy it. I wanted to put it out like you do a fire. I just wanted to stifle it. But became a lover of his brothers and sisters in Christ. I believe that he probably went and saw these persecuted people that he once persecuted and said, forgive me. I did it in ignorance. God has saved me, and I love you now. If you, can you imagine being in the room with that conversation taking place? Amazing. That's the transformed life, and that's the power of the gospel. That's why it's interesting. I think, I have many different interpretations of this I've heard over the years, but I, I think when he talks about forgetting those things which are behind, I really think about perhaps he's talking about who he once was and what God wants, wanted him to do then. Brethren, I, I count on myself to have apprehended I'm still working by the grace of God to be who Christ wants me to be. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, it's amazing how we can be discouraged by our past. I think that sometimes we, you know, there's times where we're ashamed of what we've done in the past, but we forget it. We choose to forget it. We put it back there. We know that we've been forgiven, and we reach forth unto those things which are before the will of God. Pleasing and honoring God. I press, I pursue toward the mark uh, for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. That's what he wanted to do. That's what his, his life really was all about. Do we know the gospel? Do we know what it is? Do we see it the same way that Paul saw it? It was entrusted to him in a sacred way.